Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this AHDB talk on the Beef and Lamb Monitor Farm project and how you can be part of it. My name is Sarah Pick and I work in the Knowledge Exchange team, overseeing the Strategic Farm and Monitor Farm projects. With me this evening, I have my colleague, Leah Shanks, who is the Knowledge Exchange Manager in the Southwest region. And we also have Ian Norbury and David Barton, two of our existing strategic farmers, who will explain how being involved in the project has helped their businesses. But before we get going with this evening's meeting, I'm firstly going to run through the technology so that you know how to ask questions. So you will see on the right hand of your screen, there'll be a toolbar. If it's not maximized, click on the orange arrow here, and this will open up the toolbar options. You then need to scroll down to where it says questions and click on the down arrow here, and this will open the question box. Type in your question and then just remember to press send. Just to check that technology is, is working, um, can you just answer this question by um, putting either A, B, C or D in the answer box? So if you were a monitor farmer, what would be your main focus area? Would it be A, grassland, B, health, C, breeding or D, understanding your finances? OK, so it looks like uh, that's working, so I will get going. So the plan for this evening's discussion is I will just give an overview of the Farm Excellence platform, talking about the existing uh, strategic farm project and then the Monitor Farm project as well. I will talk about the aims of the Monitor Farm project, the benefits of being a host farmer and also what the role of the host farmer is. I will then bring in two of our existing strategic farmers, Ian Norbury and David Barton, and they will talk through their experiences of um, being in, in the project. I'll then finish by talking through the application process. Hopefully you'll still all be interested um, by then, so I'll let you know about how you can apply, um, and then we'll finish with a, a question and answer session at the end. We will hopefully finish no later than half past eight. So I've probably confused you all uh, thoroughly already um, by talking about both strategic farms and monitor farms. So I thought the best thing for me to do was to start by explaining the difference between the two. So basically, the monitor farms um, have evolved from the, the, the strategic farms. The strategic farms were recruited in 2017 and 2019, and there's 15 um, within that group. For those of you who haven't been able to go to one of the strategic farm events, um, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction of, of what uh, the process is. So like the Monitor Farm programme, Strategic Farms is a four year project where each strategic farmer puts together a set of targets and focus areas that they'd like to work on over the course of the project. With the help of farmers and other industry professionals, the strategic farmer makes changes uh, to their business to increase its performance. It's also a great opportunity um, for the farmers who attend the events to share their experiences and learn from the information presented at the events. So this is very similar to how the Monitor Farm programme will work. However, uh, we've made a few tweaks. So we start, as I said, we started the strategic farm program in 2017 and you kind of learn what works and what doesn't. And that has then evolved into the monitor farm project. So one of the major differences between the two is that the monitor farmer has a steering group and the steering group consists of farmers and other industry experts um, and that will help and provide guidance to the monitor farmer. Another change is that there is a discussion group um, set up around each monitor farm and that again provides another platform uh, for farmers to share ideas. So in a nutshell, we've tweaked the, st the strategic farm 
program and it's uh, evolved into the Monitor Farm project. But overall, the, uh, the aim is very similar, to bring farmers together, to share information and best practice, and of course, to improve business performance. And as a host farmer, you are the focal point for this. So I'm now just going to talk about the Monitor Farm project. So like the Strategic Farm project, it's four years. So two, the first two years will be quite intensive, um, where you'll get a lot of help from consultants, AHDB staff and other industry experts, where you work towards your focus areas. The second two years will be mainly monitoring. So I'll be monitoring what impact the changes that you've made in the first two years have had on your business. You will have a huge amount of support and guidance throughout the project. So once you're recruited, you will have a dedicated member of the AHDB KE team. Uh, that could be me, it could be my colleague Leah or somebody else in the team. But we will be there to provide support if you have any uh, problems, we're your first point of contact. We'll also organise all the events so you won't have anything um, to worry about there. As soon as you're recruited, we want to um, look and understand where your strengths and weaknesses are. So we'll be undertaking a number of, of baseline assessments. Um, they could include an agribusiness review or a carbon audit. Or if you're finishing uh, beef or lamb, we might also do a finishing review as well. It just, again, depends on, on your business. As I've also said, a key part of the Monitor Farm project is that you will have a steering group. So you will have a lot of input into who sits on that steering group. It might be, for example, um, some farmers in your region who, who you really look up to, or it might be somebody else involved um, within the industry, such as a, a nutritionist. And they will help you um, throughout the project. They'll be there to, again, to to support you and to provide that guidance. And they'll also choose the topics for your on-farm events as well. As I've also said, when we put together your focus areas, we'll then draft in some industry experts. So they might be, again, farmers, they might be consultants or nutritionists, and they will help you um, meet your targets. And finally, you'll have a discussion group um, and you'll be expected to be part of that. AHDB will do all the organisation, the facilitation, everything. You will just be expe expected to attend that discussion group. You also won't be expected to host um, the group. Um, I can imagine that every, it'll rotate around everybody within that group. So the benefits of being a monitor farmer. As I've said, we will equip you with the tools and techniques to evaluate your farm's weaknesses. And we'll be able to work on, on that throughout the four years. It will also provide you with kind of a fresh pair of eyes, because I think we're all quite guilty of you get involved in the day to day stuff. And it's quite hard to actually see where do I want to be in, in five or 10 years time and, and how am I going to achieve that? So hopefully by being involved with the Monitor Farm project, you'll be able to take a step back and, and have a look at your business. As I've said, you will have a huge amount of support and guidance throughout the project, whether that's AHDB staff or consultants or the other strategic farms. We're all here to, to help you throughout the project. You will also see that it will boost your profile within the industry. If we look at Ian and David, our two speakers for this evening, this year Ian has been nominated for Farmers Weekly Beef Farmer of the Year. Um, and David is the NFU uh, Southwest Livestock Board Chairman. So it really does um, boost your profile. Of course, you'll be, you know, you'll be on uh, social media, in, in magazines and, and things like that. So we really will um, get your name out there. And also, sometimes it's fun. Um, 
you know, we, we try and uh, get you away to conferences. Um, a couple of years ago, I took our strategic farms across to Ireland um, to visit the Chagas over there for their beef open day. So there are a, a lot of opportunities. Um, it isn't just, just hard work. The role of the monitor farmer. So over the course of the four years, um, you will host eight events. They won't, they won't all be on farm. Um, some will be, some might be on one of the steering groups farms, or they might be online um, such as this. But of course your uh, AHDB uh, staff member will, will organize that event and they will lead you, you through um, the event as well. You will also be expected to record and share both financial and technical information. Um, so AHDB has its uh, own free costing service called FarmBench. So each year you'll be expected to record your data um, via that system. And that will help us track um, your performance throughout the four years. And we can um, measure the impact of the changes that you've made on your business. You'll also be expected to provide case studies uh, for use in the media. We in no way um, want you to be you know, writing articles and, and things like that. It will literally be somebody in our comms team will give you a ring um, and just uh, it'll just be a conversation and they will write the article. So there'll be nothing like that. It'll just be inputting into those. You'll also be um, expected to provide update videos. I don't know if you've seen um, on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel and across social media that during lockdown, our strategic farmers have been putting out um, videos on what they've been up to over the last couple of months. But of course, you'll be provided with training on that. We would also like you to engage on social media. Um, it seems this is an, an avenue, avenue that's, that's really taking off and, and does seem um, to work well. So we would like to do that. But of course, again, we will provide you with all the training that you need. As I've already mentioned, you will be part of, of the discussion group. You will be expected to attend, um, but you won't be expected to host every single um, meeting. It's just that, they, that you're there um, as part of that discussion group. That discussion group will be recruited at your launch meeting. So it's likely that you will probably already know um, the people that will attend that. And of course, you will also be an ambassador for AHDB. So we will um, update you on all the things that AHDB are doing so that you, when you get questions um, about the levy board, you can hopefully answer them. So what makes a good monitor farmer? Well, you need to be able to commit the time and effort um, towards it. Um, Ian and, and David will update us on, on how much time they think it, it takes, but it's really important that you can um, give the, the time required. You need to be receptive to new ideas and willing to make changes. Obviously, when you're hosting the events and talking to your steering group, they will be um, saying about changes that you might want to make. So it's important that you are receptive to those. You also need to be open minded. Um, so we might offer um, if you'd like to be part of a, a research trial um, or there might be some new technology that we would like you to have a go with. So it's really important that you're, you're willing um, to have a go with, that, with those. A final point is that it's important that all business members are committed to the project. Um, so whoever is involved in your farm, it's really important that they all want to be part of the project um, because that's when it really works and, and you will then get the most out of it. So that's enough of me um, waffling on. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavor of the Monitor Farm project. Like I said, if you've got any questions, do put them into the... Um, question box and I will make sure I answer them at the end. But now I'm going to uh, bring in Ian. So Ian's going to talk to us about his experience of being a, um, a strategic farm 
a strategic farmer. So Ian joined us in um, 2017. Yep, correct. And so you've been involved in the project for three years. Yep. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, Ian. Can you just start by just giving an introduction um, to your farm? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a beef suckler finisher. So I, I take everything from my suckler cows being born right the way through to being finishing, uh, selling dead weight, um, originally just into slaughterhouses. Recently, I've just started dealing with more local butchers and trying to get a bit more control of, of my own price. And I think some of that's come about with the uh, uh, the networking and the publicity that I've gained through being part of uh, part of AHDB Strategic Farms. Um, so how how many cows do you have on at home, and whereabouts so, in the so country are when you? When I started the project, that was one of the things. When I started the project, yeah, um, I'd, I'd worked off farm for a bit. I'd, I'd worked in construction and come back, and uh, my dad had sort of uh, just been ticking over sort of thing and when I came back obviously I had to make some real big changes and a lot of changes and at that time that's when I saw the the advert for uh, for strategic farms and thought well I've nothing to lose so I, I applied and, and yeah shockingly to uh to myself uh, got an interview and then and then tried desperately to talk you guys out of not uh, out of it. <laughs> you uh you stuck with me um uh, so, so, so yeah, so I knew I had to take a, a lot of radical changes. My dad's quite a uh, very old school. Um, traditional. Yeah, very traditional uh, farmer where, where like the farm should life and and I didn't want to fall into the same trap. I've got a young family um, and I, I'd worked off farm and I'd earned a good living working off farm as well. So, so it, I, I do love farming. I'm passionate about farming. Uh, I'm passionate about like my stock and, and, and breeding and that's really important to me but at the end of the day number one is my kids and my wife and, and I've got to be making money and, and, and through, through doing all this stuff uh, and having the support of the consultants and other things it, it does make you completely justify and, and accountable for them decisions you're making so when I came back we had 70 cows well if I'm expecting to make I've got a real, I'll be dead honest with everyone, I've got a real figure in my head. I want to make 30 grand a year off my beef, off my beef, because I know I can make more than that going back doing what I was doing. And, and that's regardless of like subsidies, that's what what where I want to achieve. I think that should be achievable. I think that's that's fair that I should be able to earn that because that's my, my main business. And, and the other things that I have going on on the farm, I see that as all like, um, uh, icing on the cake basically because I'd, I'd have that regard I'd have them other incomes anyway even if I was yeah. renting the farm out um and, and it does when, when you take like a figure like 30 grand and, and put it over 70 cows it's a lot of money and you're thinking well if I'm expecting to make that profit per cow that's unrealistic everyone would be doing it it'd be you know yeah. farmers, would be, farmers would be happy and, and and laughing all the way to the bank um uh, and it's stuff like that when it, so when so that was a driver for upscaling and thinking well you know if we go to 100 cows that makes it a lot less figure per cow because it's diluting all my costs um, and how how many cows do you have now so, so i was hoping to be i'll be dead honest i should be at 120 that's where i was aiming to be i'm a little bit under 120 because i uh the way i up the numbers was bullying a lot of heifers and, and buying some in all in one year and and it didn't go like, like all these things it didn't go 100 percent according to plan i had a hard carving year um but also by by working with the consultants and 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 having to collect all this data made it so um important because that data was there to review and and see why why we'd had them issues and and talk through them and and bounce ideas off of other people like reasons why it could have been and and it was just literally we we we've put it down to one thing that it was the group of heifers I brought in just didn't perform how they should have done um right. so it wasn't necessarily uh, an underlying issue or or necessarily a management issue it was just what one of them things Bad and that's, uh, that's that's yeah that really drives me to collect a lot of data now because if you've got it you don't you don't have to use it but if you haven't got it you can't use it um yeah so, so yeah, so we're, so we're just under 120. Um, my ambition is probably to once I, so I've, I've changed a lot, a lot of things, loads of things. 
Um, so just and, and going back to... then, what what have your focus areas been then throughout the the project? So, so one of them so, is grassland. Yeah, grass grassland. So informating rotational grazing, um, which has been mind boggling, and I'm by no means an expert. And I, I'm picking up things every day and, and the young lad that helps me, I get him to come and spend a lot of time in the office now because just someone's different view. And that's a great thing yeah. about having open days on farm. You've got fresh eyes on the farm, people with different ideas and they're provoking your your thinking. I mean, I, I was born here, brought up here, so I'm a bit blindsided to the way things are done. And, and I found that's added loads of uh, value to, to my business. Um, and be, being held accountable, to be honest, if someone says to me, like, you know, why are you doing that? And I can't justify a reason why I'm spending that money or doing it. Yeah. I shouldn't be doing it because it's either making it co more complicated than it needs to be or or I'm spending money that I don't need to spend, which is obviously I've got to get that back at the end of the day. So, so the That's it. main driver was reducing costs, which is part of rotational grazing. That's the cheapest way I'm going to feed and finish my yeah. cattle, hopefully, if I can grow the quality grass. And um, you also out winter as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's made out our wintering as well. So we used to house, we used to wean, we used to snatch wean, what I'd call. So we'd bring them into the sheds uh, start of November and we'd we'd pull the calves off the cows. They'd go in one shed, cows go in the other. Um, so I was brave enough to try outdoor weaning. And a few, well, every, well, a lot of people were like, don't do it, don't do it. And with the yeah. support of, of kind of the network through HDB and, and also just being, um, uh, a bit more recognised within the industry because of the publicity stuff and, and using the social media, it meant that I could source someone who had done it, who was actually who was actually doing it already, and and give them yeah. be really, just give them a call and ask for their help. Because the worst thing I wanted to do was was try it and it fail and be put off trying it again. So so I sort of set out and, and went after someone who'd done it and, and gained off their knowledge um, to say this is what I'm going to do is there anything that you think I need to be doing differently or you know is, is that what you do and and pretty much I didn't have to change much what I had in my head and, and it was more the reassurance that I was giving it the best shot yeah worked, worked wonderful I'd, I'd never go back now it's a lot less stress on the calves um so I, so I bring them up I separate them in the yard I take them back down I put the calves in one paddock cows in the other paddock next to each other and just move them apart over the next few days um, which means I, I don't have to bring the calves in, I don't have to bring the cows in. The cows can go on to rougher, poorer grazing and I can manage yeah. their condition better. The calves can go off around this, the silage ground uh, and do little damage because of the, le the less weight and they're getting the top quality grass which is pushing them on so I've got less of a growth check. Um, yeah. And do you know what live weight gains you're getting from um, the cattle on the rotational gra uh, that are rotationally grazing? So, so, so the first year, so, so I'm aiming for a kilo a day, yeah. average all the way across. But again, we've been able to um, get hold of different bits of technology uh, instead of using my old weighing system and just seeing what the average daily gain was from from the last time they were weighed to that to this time they were weighed. Uh, I use um, a, a bit of software that's free called MyHub that's linked to True Test Kit, and that means I can I can set a target. Where I want them animals to be finished at, at, at whatever date, yeah. uh, and that tracks them through their lifetime. So if I'm not getting a, a kilo a day, but they're still on they're still on target to be finished when I want them to be finished, and I want to be putting them into the market, I'm not like doing a knee jerk reaction, going oh they're not doing a kilo a day, panicking. As long as they're on target, I'm I'm, I'm quite happy. Um, so it's looking yeah. at like the overall picture more than. Um, more than yeah. knee-jerk reaction. The, the first year, again, I probably managed it a little bit, a little bit wrong. I was, I was moving my, my store finishers uh, on a daily basis, so I, I was allocating them grass every day. I think because I was learning, I probably wasn't just allocating them the, the right amount. I was probably being a bit hard on them, yeah. and and that was really good through going to other AHDB to Strategic Farms or Monitors Farms. I, I went there, and that was a real eye opener to to what people who've been doing it before. Were leaving behind and that made me realize i was being too hard on them um and, yeah. and, and thinking too much about the residual um so yeah i still go to, to a lot of meetings and 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 still learn a lot off, off everyone in the group or even people that aren't in the group um, Brilliant. 
Brilliant. And one of the thing, the other things that you looked at when you uh, talking about reducing cost was the mineral buckets. Do you want yeah. to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so my dad had uh, always used mineral buckets for like general purpose mineral mineral licks, and he was a real big believer in pre-carving mineral mineral licks. Um, so dead easy. Find them invoices. Work out in a twelve month period. It worked out that we were giving each cow, so cows and finishers, so every animal on the farm pretty much was getting £22 a year in mineral licks, um, which is a lot of money when you when you times yeah. that by, say, 300 stock. Um, so, yeah, that was one thing I definitely wanted to change. And and through working with, with AHDB, I'm a, I'm a vet, because... Uh, Part of the part of the thing is, or part of what we were doing, they were keen to get our vets involved, and and everyone worked together. Um, we did some blood testing, um, and we moved we moved on to boluses, which was yeah quite daunting because my dad thinks I'm a little bit crazy and doesn't really necessarily <laughs> buy into all this stuff. Um, but by blood testing, we could make sure we were giving them the right bolus, and if there was any problems there the blood tests weren't too far out um so we went from 22 pound a head to four pound 60 a head so we just gave them one bolus wow. in a 12-month in a period um which was very very scary and that's where the support of like your consultant and and your vet and, and speaking to everyone is really 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 helpful and then also uh, something came along at the same time from edinburgh university they wanted suckler breeders to do colostrum testing and transfer from from dams to calves so that fell just at the right time that it meant um when we did have that crop of calves on the ground um after not using the mineral licks and not using the pre-carvers yeah. that we could double check which was great and so much so that uh the, the following year i paid and, and actually did it myself um off my own back because we had forage that was a little bit lower in protein and a lot of heifers carving, um, but the contacts were there and yeah, and I knew it was going to work and dead beneficial. And it's just double checking stuff like that and making sure that. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. You have that reassurance, don't you? Yeah, definitely, because the yeah. amount of things we've changed and all and all at once and yeah, it, it's it is a massive help and it and it's it's huge it's hugely helped my business. Um, yeah, the Brilliant. amount of things change it's gone yeah and one of the things that i did mention is the the time it, you have to put into the program how much time do you think it takes you you know do, have you had to dedicate much time i, I it, probably or? be fair i this sounds a bit big-headed i probably <laughs> spend a, a lot of time um uh because i don't so when i get asked to do something i don't say no but i think that's so beneficial to my to my business it's hugely beneficial. So the time you might think are oh, you spending towards that, you should be spending on your business anyway. Um, you, you know, so you should be knowing them figures. Uh, so it's negligible really, because you should you should be spending that time on your business anyway. Um, and it's all good. So I so I'm trying to build a brand because I do pedigree sales as well. So it's yeah. all helps the mobley angus. I'll get it in there quick. <laughs> So it all it all helps, and that and that has opened up loads of opportunities. By lots of my mates at a farmers say to me, they're like, oh, you know, why do you give? Why have you, you must have took you ages to do that or do this and yeah. that and the other. And but I think the benefits I get from it are just like far outweigh everything uh, for, for not just me, but for for my for my, my staff as well. I've got a young lad, not from a farming background, really passionate about pushing him on because he's so keen. Uh, so I'm trying to create really good opportunities for him and, and get him in touch yeah. with best farmers to push him onto places like that. And doing stuff like this, it does just open up like endless opportunities. Brilliant. Uh, and I, I promise everybody that's listening, I haven't paid Ian to say that. So just, <laughs> just my uh, final question. Why should someone apply to be a monitor farmer? Because we all pay levy. So it's just getting your own money back, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, so uh, you should do because if you care about your business and, and you're passionate about the industry, then it's not going to do you any harm at all. Um, I mean, I'll be dead honest. There's things that I set out to find out when I, when I when I applied for the project that I've still not found out. Um, but every day of the week, I'd still definitely apply for it because I've gained so much from it. My business has gained so much from it. Um, 
personally and, and business wise really uh i met like a, a great group of people um like I say up numbers massively and and new opportunities like dealing with with these butchers and stuff i'm taking control instead of accepting the price i'm getting yeah. and then and, and part of going through the process and having the open days has given me the confidence to do that um and go out there and go actually you know what i'm doing i'm doing really well and and sort of champion it and um Brilliant. yeah it's, you've, you've nothing you've nothing to yeah you haven't anything to lose have you it's uh like i say you might have to spend a bit of time it might be a bit daunting to some people to think oh having open days and stuff but by far i think it's the most beneficial thing you can do is yeah. getting other people to come to your farm and it's very rare you get an opportunity um and whenever people do come to my farm i'm really really um stern with them that they have to be honest and they have to tell me stuff because that's that's where I get stuff back. If people just yeah. walk down around and don't say anything, or or typical farmers are a bit shy and not scared of like, or, or scared of challenging you or making you justify why you've done stuff, you're not gonna. I'm not gonna get anything out of it. I want people to go, well, why did you do that? And and or how much does that cost? And or how much cheaper is that? And and if I can't justify why, then I want I'll, I'll go back and I'll find out because yeah, yeah. I shouldn't have. That's it. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, Ian. That was great. And Ian will be around to answer any questions at the end as well. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Leah, who's going to chat to David. David, where are you? There you are. Hello. Thank you for joining us this evening. And um, we'll make a start. So could you please tell us a little bit about you, David, where you are in the world and what you farm? OK, uh, well, we're farming near uh, Sirencester in Gloucestershire and uh, typical sort of Cotswold um, uh, brash, which is very light, stony ground. Um, we've got a beef sucker herd of um, Salur crosses. Uh, we're crossing them with South Devons and now uh, Sussex. Um, trying to make our cows a bit smaller. And so we want uh, cows that live outside because we outwinter them on turnips till sort of mid-January so that's the type of cow that we're breeding and uh, we also do some arable at the moment although that's changing but uh, um, yeah we're about um, 260 acres and uh, yeah. And all those years ago what made you apply to be a strategic farmer? Um, I think it was um, I'm just um, I'm quite open about my business and um, uh, I wanted to improve it and it was just a sort of right time to look at that. Um, I knew, um, uh, you know, beef suckers, it's difficult making a margin. So I wanted to try and really look at how we could do that. And it was a great opportunity um, to, um, you know, focus, have a really good look at where the business was going. And um, it certainly done that. And, you know, my main focus was uh, we wanted to um, improve our use of grassland. Um, I know I've been a bit sort of lazy with that. It sort of it grows in the spring and that was it. And so um, we've made lots of uh, improvements there, uh, amongst other things. Yeah. So let's talk about your focus areas. And so you said one of them was grassland. What were the other things you were focusing on? Um, well, we've looked at a whole range of things. Um, grassland was the main. That was my main sort of aspect. I wanted to improve that. Um, we've also looked at, at the breeding and um, uh, the uh, uh, a whole a whole range of things. So we've we've improved lots of small things, uh, and it sort of starts to starts to stack up. So uh, nutritionist making better quality silage, uh, and so we um, we can reduce our our cereal input into the diet for the cattle. And we've reduced our days to slaughter. Uh, I think we were around about. Um, 24 and a half months and we're now about 20 um so and we're still producing cattle at the same weight but we, we've taken all those all that time out of their finishing uh which has made a huge difference so um that's been our sort of um th they've been the main drivers and your grassland um so you started rotational grazing with the project didn't you what, yes how has that been for you because it is a bit of a journey isn't it um yeah it's um well, the first year, um, yeah, didn't get off to a great start, um, and uh, I think um, and then we had the the drought year, <laughs> and then we had another one this year. But what I've, it is, it takes, um, it's taken me 
um, what, three years now, and I'm just starting to feel that I'm actually getting, really getting to grips with it. Um, still got a way to go, but actually, um, there's been a couple of really challenging years with the weather. And what I've noticed is where we're rotational grazing, um, it's it's that management of grassland that makes it so much easier to, um, I mean, certainly this year, we didn't have rain for three and a half months, and that's been a challenge. But the moment the rain came back, the grass is in much better position to grow. And we've now, you know, we're back onto our rotation. Um, it's it's made a massive difference. The scope there to improve your day life weight gain and your use of grass and stocking rates uh, is huge. And, and it's been a real eye opener, really. And to start with, it seems like a lot of work. And now when I go and move electric fence, it's just part of my daily routine. And I don't really think about it. I'm checking the cattle at the same time. It's, it, you know, just... Um, it's just getting over that initial um this is different and it's something i wasn't doing before and it's taking me some time but it's really been well worth it yeah made a huge difference and weighing regularly is something that you started doing as well wasn't it so you're you know your daily live weight gain now and also dosing you're, you're able to dose really accurately aren't you yeah it's been really useful weighing um it is, is, is yes yeah, been one of the really big things that we never did before so we're weighing everything now and you're right when we're worming um, or, or if they do need any antibiotics which we don't use much of but we can do it very accurately uh, and we do that and it's so easy um, yes yeah, so we know our live weight gains now we've improved a little bit we want I think we started off at 0.9 overall and uh, we're probably I think we're just just about um, close to to a kilo a day and you know if we want to improve that obviously but it's uh, it's just monitoring it and seeing where we're going and um it's yeah you, you you can't underestimate how useful it is to to be able to weigh weigh cattle and the other thing of course we we do sell some to the market and uh uh it's, it's nice to know what the weight is when they leave the farm we sell a lot of uh, the cattle dead weight but um it's really useful to be able to weigh those cattle so when they leave the farm you know what the weight is uh and um yeah it's been it's been really really useful and uh, along with your grassland, nutrition was something that you looked at as well. And um, we asked you to report lots of data to us, don't we? Um, and it's something that you, you've really improved on doing is reporting that data. So in terms of the, the nutrition and the data reporting, how have you found that experience? OK, so, yeah, nutrition. Um was really important i think uh we have um, a nutritionist and um i think two years ago he came and did the rations and um we we could see that the silage wasn't wasn't uh, as good as it could be it was about 10 and a half me and the protein was just about okay but uh, he went through the rations and he said to me if you can make 11 and a half me silage you cut out 50 percent of your cereals and you think well right okay that shouldn't be that difficult and um well maybe it's not that easy but it's not so difficult to actually improve the silage so we did have some um, sort of uh, just over 11 or 11 and a half last year and uh, sort of 15, 16 percent protein. And it's made a massive difference uh, to all the stock that have been fed on it. Um, and it's just that attention to detail, making sure that, uh, you know, getting it cut in good time. Um, we're doing three, a uh, good three or possibly even four cuts now. Um, we only ever used to do two. And, you know, the benefits of having that really good quality fodder, uh, fodder is, um, uh, is, is, is just is, is huge. And uh, so, yeah, through with the nutritionist, the other thing we've looked at as well, as Ian mentioned, uh, we did the same project with um, the uh, colostrum. And, the, you know, I've always thought uh, that the colostrum is so, so important with, uh, with suckle, suckle calves. And um, we know we need to be really careful at calving that those cows, because suckle hack cows generally have a, a pretty tough time. They don't get overfed. Uh, but it's really important just going coming up to calving and through that period that they have uh, the correct uh, um, balanced diet. And we, we just gave them this year a little bit of uh, rape meal uh, for protein. And, uh, you know, uh, we've had no problems at all with, with any um, calf scours or joint or anything like that. They've just been really healthy calves and they've done really well. And it's just important to get that colostrum right and make sure that they get enough. So, again, that was um, that was really useful. Yeah. Um, there was something else you asked me, and I can't remember what it was now. I might move on to, to more on the project. So as your knowledge exchange manager, you can call me anytime you like. And you, you've mentioned a few other people, but who else has helped you along the way? 
Um, well, I've, I've had uh, Helen Evans, a consultant, and uh, Helen's been really, really useful in keeping me sort of organised and making sure that um, uh, that I'm on track with uh, getting re reporting the data, which um, is, is quite a quite a challenge. But uh, it's really useful to have that once once we've collected the data uh, and we use it. Uh, it's so useful to be able to benchmark yourself against other farmers and um, you know, I think as Ian said as well, you know, it's it's so useful to be able to talk uh, to farmers uh, that are doing a similar thing, and you see where they're where they're doing better than you, or where you're doing better than them, and and you learn from one another. It's 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 so beneficial. Um, it's been really really useful. And yeah, Mark Jones of Grassland, um, uh, 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 he's really helped a lot as well. The rotational grazing. So having really good advice has been um, has been really important. And then Pete Kelly too, your nutritionist. Yeah, Pete Kelly as well. Yeah, absolutely. So for you, what's it been like having strangers on farm for your events? I've really enjoyed it because um, uh, you know I, I'm I'm very open about what we're doing and uh, where we're going wrong and where where things are improving, and so it's been really useful to have um, that really honest, frank discussion with other farmers. They're asking questions and. Um, um, and, and that's really, I think, we, we learn so much from one another and it's, it, they've been really good fun, they've been well attended and um, everyone comes with a, with a positive attitude and um, yeah, I've taken a lot from it. They've been really, really useful days and um, I think um, it's, it's nice. I, I would enjoy going to a meeting where you don't you start off with a PowerPoint and you're just getting down to the, uh, uh, the realities of what we're actually doing, looking at the real figures and it's, it's real life stuff. I think people appreciate that and they sort of they've enjoyed going on the journey with me yeah it's been great and time is money how much time does it take to be a strategic farmer or monitor farmer it's a good question I, I mean i haven't really kept a diary of how much time i've spent um i have spent quite a bit of time on it but um you only get out what you put in with these things and um i've got a great deal out of it so you know i i don't really i think it's been time well spent and uh um I, I I don't think that the time issue is not is not a constraint for me at all on this one because uh, you know the business is much healthier because of it and so yeah you know it it has been time really well spent and um, I guess the getting the um, the data together initially is quite a it's quite a task but once you've done that and then you you, you know you the, the, got the first year under your belt then it's uh, it's not such a big task and it's really useful to have that yeah it's been really important. If someone came to you and said they wanted to be the next monitor farmer, what tips would you give them to get the most out of the programme? Um, well, I think as long as you've got an attitude that um, the way I look at it is that it doesn't matter how well you're doing, you can always do a little bit better. And if you're always looking to how you can do that little bit better, then um, it's just a great it's a great thing to get into. And um, uh, I'd thoroughly recommend it. I really would. Um, as long as you've got the right attitude, um, you're going to get an awful lot out of it. So, um, you know, it's it's a win-win, really. Thank you. Thanks, David. And um, we'll bring Sarah back in now and she's going to talk through the application details. Thanks both. Um, so like I said, Ian and David will be available to answer any questions at the end. So please do type your questions um, into the to the box and we'll we'll answer those uh, shortly. So I just want to finish by talking through the application process. So hopefully you're all still um, interested in applying. Um, the application form can be found on the website. Um, that's the that's the link you can find it by going through the farm excellence pages the deadline for applications is the 30th of september um, if you have any questions or you're finding it difficult uh, to complete the application form um, there are some contact details on there on the website so that you can get in touch with us so once the uh, application deadline has passed, we will shortlist um, those farmers who we think are most suitable um, and then we'll have an informal telephone interview. So that's basically so that you can ask any questions um, about the, the project um, and hopefully you'll all, all still be interested after that. Um, so that telephone interview will then be followed by a, a, a farm interview where we'll basically just 
just come and visit you and uh, check the farm and, and everything like that. So it's nothing to worry about. They're both very informal. It's just for us to get to know you and you to get to know us. If you're then successful, um, you will join the Monitor Farm project in January 2021. Um, we will have a meeting in January um, to get you to, to get you as the new recruits and the existing strategic farmers together, so we can give you a bit of an induction. And it also means you can uh, get to know the existing strategic farmers, and they can offer you some advice. So we will now move on to questions. Like I said, if you would just like to type your question into the question box um, and press send, um, Leah will then read them out. Okay, so first questions for you, Sarah. So does yeah. it matter what type of farm I have, breeding, store or finishing? It doesn't at all. As long as you've got beef and sheep on your farm, please go ahead and apply. We're perfect. And um, if David and Ian, if you could put your cameras and your mics back on, we've got a couple of questions for you both as well. So first question, um, have either of you had any health or disease issues in your herds that being in the Strategic Farms project has helped or not helped with? That's a really hard one. Um, So I, I, I've been tagging testing for, for, for years uh, for BVD, um, so I was kind of doing that already. Um, but but then when, when I did buy the group of heifers in, that was one thing that you know my consultant helped me with was making sure that bringing stock on that that they were of a good health status and and we re, we, we request, requested the farm that were buying them off to do extra tests or that he tagged and tested them before we moved them so we weren't bringing anything on. Um, so just being sensible, really. Um, so, yeah, it's not, nothing nothing that majorly sticks out. Worming-wise, so we do, we do egg count, so I don't routinely worm now. That's been something that uh, I've been encouraged to do it, and, and that's saving me money, and I'm not really seeing any, any bad effects from that yet. Um, so yeah, that's bad effects for me. How about you, David? Yeah, we had um, uh, we've had one cow uh, that's been positive for yonis, uh, which is disappointing, and we have a plan in place to manage that, uh, which I've sort of gone through my vet. Um, that's the only issue that's sort of come up since being a strategic farm. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, it's just um, it's been useful having uh, uh, the focus to to look at it and uh, do something about it. Um, but other than that, we haven't had um, anything um uh, to, to date yeah um i'll just put in there um so i know one of the farmers um in cumbria um he's had yonis as well um and has been blood testing to try and eradicate that and another of the strategic farms down in um the southwest um he um is now tag and testing for bvd Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you have to have beef and sheep or can you have beef only? No, you can either have beef um, or sheep. So it doesn't matter if you don't have a mixture, as long as you have beef and sheep, beef or sheep on your farm, uh, please, yeah, go ahead and apply. Ian, you spoke earlier about your um, true test weighing software and the system. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it is that you're using? So, so I did before I got involved. I was I was weighing, um, but I was weighing with an easy weigh seven and just using the last three digits of the tags. Um, bear in mind, back then I only had seventy cows, and I thought just to find a stick reader would be uh, a big a big ask. Um, and then being part of the project was given the chance to to use the state of the art reader that was loaned to us from True Test, um, so the XR5000 and the stick reader. And within probably a couple of hours of having the chance to, to use the stick reader, I'd ordered reusable tags for for all my animals. Um, I was that impressed with it. It was just so quick, so easy. Eliminates all mistakes. Um, my cows go through the race better. 
Uh, it means that if I'm working with my dad who, who's elderly, he can be out of the way. He can scan them with the stick. He's not having to learn how to use the technology. He presses a button, he waves it at the cow. It's it's pretty foolproof, and I can be in the back pushing them through the race uh, where it's a bit more dangerous. Uh, and the amount of data I can collect on on the XR5000 as opposed to um, the, the the way the way head I was running for is just phenomenal, and uh, they will have to drag it off me by uh, tooth and nail. To be honest, it is one thing that um, I, I probably wouldn't have even even thought about getting. To be honest, uh, because I don't I don't consider myself as doing big numbers, but now I've been given the opportunity to use it, I, I would definitely not be going back. Thank you, and um, for Ian and David. Would you have done the rotational grazing if you weren't in the project? So, so I, I was probably playing around with it a little bit, or or possibly more strip grazing. I hadn't started doing back fencing before uh, I got involved in the project, uh, and and the major stumbling point for me was um, infrastructure to so getting water because I had quite small groups, so so I needed to be putting them on small on small like blocks of land and it was like well how am I going to get water to all these blocks of land uh, and then through through going to AHDB meetings and, and stuff I came across uh, these are called water hydrants dead cheap 45 pound and they'll do 50 cows and just going out and and, and seeing different things and that just fixed it for me straight away so it was a really low really low um investment 45 quid for this water trough that's going to feed 50 50 cows and if i'd seen it in an advert or whatever i would have laughed at it i would have gone my cows would trash that but actually being out on farm and seeing it and and, and knowing the people that were, were were feeding me that information about using it knowing them through through doing other stuff was just i've got a trust in them and that, that if they were if they weren't any good they wouldn't be telling me they were any good uh, and that just sold it for me overnight, and then I could start using back fences, and then yeah, I could just see straight away. So, so I probably still would have gone down it, but it's really helped me and uh, and speeded up the process because it is very it is very daunting to but buy some electric fen buy some electric fencing. You can always sell it and and buy a trough and and just get play around with it and uh, and get on. What about you, David? Yeah, I. I, I think if I'm honest, I probably uh, I might have tried it and then I'd have I'd have given up. So um, the thing is, you you've got to you've got to persevere with it to get it right. And the first couple of years, it's it's, it's not been easy. And I think having having the support of um, a grassland specialist certainly has kept it on track. And uh, and now I've now I've got there. I think yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And I'd, I'd recommend anybody. But yeah, if I'm honest. I'd have, I'd have tried, failed, and probably thought that's just a waste of time, and I'm not going to bother with that. So, yeah, definitely, um, it would probably not have happened had it not been for the project. Yeah. Yeah, and just while we're on the topic of grassland, Ian, I know you've tried unwrapped hay this year. Can you just yeah. talk about that? Because that's really interesting. Well, well, we'll, we'll see when uh, we'll see when yeah. December comes. So. Uh, so, so I winter on kale. So normally I, I'd sow the kale uh, and then put bales down either side for the cows. So on my day to day of feeding the cows, I'd move the kale fence either a meter or two meters, uh, whatever their allocation was, depending on on the growth of the crop. And then I give them a bale either end, uh, which is probably a bit more more hay than I need to give them or haylage, but. Uh, it's a lot of cows get round one bin. That's how I justify it in my head. So I, so I could save costs even more there if I, if I was a bit braver. Um, uh, and yeah, this this year where the field was, it was right next to where the bale stack was too. So I must have had 200 bales in the field and then about another 300 bales in the stack. And I thought this just looks a bit um, a bit extreme with the amount of bale wrap. And and then when you take into the account the cost of, of what it costs you to get a bale and the cost of wrap alone. Um, so other people I'd, I'd seen on Twitter that um, we just became friends with and stuff and, and, and part of networking again probably I'd seen them do like bail pods and, and unwrap bales um, so again cheekily phoned one of them up and said like you know if I wanted to try this how, what what's going to be the best way to make it work um, so I had a discussion with them and, and they said oh you need to use a slightly different baler so you need to get a belt baler and that'll bail the bales tighter and and put more layers on 
and the amount that you'll lose off the outside will be will be negligible. So they've been out probably, I bet they've been out maybe four weeks now, and they still look quite fine. So so literally, I, I've I've uh, I've gone in, I've made the hay, I've baled it with the baler, and I put the bales out where presumably I'm going to need to to feed them. Uh, without any bale wrap so as opposed to it was probably cost me eight pound for, for a wrap bale i think it's cost me two pound thirty to get them baled um actual baling cost like uh so so hopefully that'll be a big saving it'll help my carbon footprint it looks yeah. a lot better uh, it'll be I really interesting it will be very interesting it will be interesting but yeah like i say i uh yeah we, time will tell time will tell on that one it'll be really good one of one other thing I did today that was that was really good. Cool, I've been in the office working things out, and another thing a child was feeding when, when I brought my cows in before carving because I carve inside was feeding them late at night to get them to carve in the day because I work on my own, and I've been working things out today. And it's one of the bits of information that I've collected over time, but I've never sort of gone back and looked at it and seen how effective it was and we worked out today that by feeding them later at night 77 percent of them carved in the day or 77 percent of them carved between the hours of six in the morning and nine at night which i'd, I'd class as, as as my day sort of thing um so yeah I, I really believe in that i really think that's that's worked really well for me and then that was really good because I, I collected that data i hadn't used it before and by doing what i've been doing today it sort of made me do it and I thought I, I didn't expect it to be anything like that I was uh, really surprised when I when I worked the percentage out how high it was I think we've got two questions left so first one's to Sarah how often will the monitor farm steering group meet and who would normally be in that group so the steering group will meet twice um, a year um, and that group will usually consist of about seven members um, and that might be farmers or uh, people who work in the industry and it will be the monitor farmer who will recommend people who they think might be good on that steering group um, and then we will have a think about who else in the region um, might be might be good at that role but it's basically people that that you maybe look up to within your region um, who's maybe already offered you advice or um, who you're already working with but like I said we will come to you and ask you for recommendations but it'll consist of about seven to ten people thank you um, and last question for David what is the live weight of the cattle you sent to slaughter at 20 months and what was what did they weigh at 24 months okay so um the average weight of steers and heifers going dead weight um is around about uh 346 kilos and uh at 24 months it was about 347 so the weight hasn't changed we've just been more efficient getting there although i would say this year um we've um, we we dropped down maybe about five kilos, um, so uh, it, it, there has been a small drop, um, but it's it's um, negligible. So yeah, it it hasn't really made any difference on the uh, on the on the killing percentage um, or the killing weight, I should say. Um, it's just been more efficient uh, in feeding and getting them gone sooner. Thank you. That's all of our questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, all. Um, so it's my job to uh, bring the meeting to a close. I would firstly like to thank our speakers for this evening. Um, so a big, big thank you to Ian and David. It is much appreciated. I would also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Leah and Chloe, for their uh, support and help tonight. Finally, a big thank you to everyone who has been listening. Um, I really hope you have enjoyed the conversation. The meeting has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube very shortly um, so that you can watch it again. Once the webinar ends, you will be taken to a survey where you can provide feedback on um, tonight's call. Please do try, if you can, to fill this in. It just helps us tailor meetings such as these um, so that we ensure you get the most out of them. So once again, thank you all very much and good evening.